Welcome to the online causal inference seminar. Today, we're very excited to have Fan Lee from uh, Duke University, who will speak about causal mediation analysis for sparse and irregular longitudinal data. Uh, she will uh, stop from time to time to take your questions, so please submit them in Q&A. In Q&A, we also have uh, Shuxi Zeng, who will be happy to answer uh, your questions. After the talk, we'll have a discussion by Georgia Papadogioidou. Um, and uh, after that, uh, we, if we have time left, we will uh, take some more of your questions. Um, I'm now switching over to uh, Michael, who will handle the question today. Uh, thanks, Dominic. So uh, today we are lucky to have Shushi Zhang uh, helping us with Q&A. So please submit your questions and we'll try to answer um, as many as possible. And we will also um, try to direct some questions to Fawn Live. So um, if we... Uh, select your question to be asked live, I'll reach out to you and uh, ask you to uh, raise your hand. Keep in mind that uh, this is being recorded. Um, so with that, I'll switch over to Fawn. Uh, please start whenever you're ready. So I share my screen? Yes. Okay. So everyone can see it? That's great. Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get started. So uh, uh, I thank the uh, organizer, um, Guido, Guillaume, uh, Michael, and Dominic for organizing this wondering, uh, this wonderful uh, online cause inference seminar during the pandemic. And it has been really a, a great resource for all the cause inference researchers. And at least for me, it's every day, every Tuesday is one of the highlight of the day. Um, so really happy to uh, present here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some work, a recent work on causal mediation analysis I've done, um, as particularly for sparse and irregular longitudinal data. And the work is a, it's a joint work with my wonderful PhD student, Shu Shi Zhen, who is uh, uh, handling the Q&A, and he's really done the, the most of the hard work. And also this is with three of uh, my biologist uh, collaborators, Susan Alves, Bess Archie and Stacey Rosen Rosenbaum. And the, the paper, uh, the main paper uh, is the first coming in and also applied statistics there. Uh, other papers, working paper and the biology uh, paper is uh, uh, already appeared in PNS last year. Okay, so um, well, uh, mediation analysis is always hard to talk. <laughs> so I will try to, because of notation, so I will try to make, uh, my goal is, uh, try to make today's talk very clear and focus more on the ideas rather than the technical details. Um, so mediation analysis uh, by just a very quick overview. So it is, the goal is to study the relationship between three things. First, you have a treatment Z and you have outcome Y. And uh, then there's something in the middle called mediator, the intermediate variable M uh, line in the causal pathway between the two. So the, the Mediation analysis is to try to study the, the causal relationship between these three uh, things. The, the most uh, famous framework and the commonly used framework is this two uh, structural equation model as EM framework that was started by Baron Kenny in 86. So the idea in the Baron Kenny, the, the, the idea was to fit two linear uh, structural equation models. Uh, one is for the of the mediator given the treatment. The other one is the outcome given the treatment and the mediator. And then you interpret, you do some transformation of the model coefficients and interpret those coefficients, those transformation of the coefficients as direct or indirect effects of treatment Z, uh, treatment Z on outcome. So th this, this framework is very popular. It's uh, the, the Baron Kenny uh, paper has already been cited over a nearly, 100,000 times, one of the most cited papers ever. And it has also been much extended to beyond just linear uh, structural equation models. So there's a lot of development. But the, the interesting thing is mediation, just by the definition, it has something to do with causal. But if you look at the original Baron Kenny framework, it has nothing causal in it. So that is, um, for causal people, that is something you know uh, to chew on. So indeed, the um, so a major advancement in the, since the 1990s is try to uh, bridge to to introduce the idea, the causal inference framework, the potential outcome framework, into mediation, and so that's a so-called causal mediation analysis. Um, so this 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 uh, work this 
field has been uh, first pioneered by Robinson Greenland in 92 and then Paul, uh, where they actually defined the direct and indirect effects using potential outcomes. And then a major breakthrough or uh, landmark is uh, the EMI, the paper, uh, 2010 paper uh, by EMI, Keo and Yamamoto, uh, where they specify necessary assumptions, causal assumptions to prove that under, under those assumptions that the Baron Koenig estimated the two stage, um, the, the, the two uh, SEM uh, estimator is a causal mediation at, estimator. So essentially this is kind of the formal, the formal connection between the uh, potential outcome framework and the Baron Koenig uh, framework. So since then there's a lot of new development, a lot of uh, people uh, it did a lot of wonderful work in this field. Um, so there are new data structure and the new identification assumptions and new estimating and modeling uh, strategies and also software uh, along this line. So I just list, list a, a bunch of uh, list of a very incomplete list of the uh, authors in this field. And there's a recent accent survey by uh, uh, Liz Stewart and, uh, uh, and Wayne uh, on, the, uh, on this topic. So, um, so what today's talk is about is uh, to extend the existing EMI framework to a bit more complex structure. So we know that the standard setting in mediation is the, the treatment, mediator, and outcome, they are all univariate at a single time point. But many recent applications um, deal with the situation that at least one of the three is longitudinal or time varied. Um, so in the literature, there are two there are the two stream of uh, research on this. The first one is uh, mostly the, the mediator, one of those things, they are sparse and regularly spaced. Um, they're usually about the exposure or the mediators. And the particularly uh, a very uh, well-known paper in this is uh, Vanderbilt and the uh, Chen Chen 2017 JSSB paper. And so that's one, that, that's one domain. The other one, uh, the other stream is actually motivated from the analysis of uh, functional MRI brain imaging data, uh, where the uh, exposure and mediator and outcome, or, or outcome, they are um, brain images. So they are, they are very densely and regularly spaced time series. And then particularly Martin Lindquist had this uh, proposed this idea of functional mediation, essentially treat those uh, trajectories as functional data, which is very related to today's talk. Um, so that is another domain, uh, another stream of work. So those are all, all of this uh, existing work there. They're, however, they are not applicable to the uh, to the setting that I'm gonna talk today, as when you have irregularly spaced mediators and also outcomes. Remember in this, uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, sparse, uh, when the media, in, in the literature, when the mediator is sparse, usually, uh, as far as I know that the, the study is usually on exposure, those time varying variables are time uh, exposure or mediators, not outcomes. So first of all, so we have two, at least two uh, challenges. Uh, first, that they are the, the mediators and outcomes, they are irregularly spaced. And second, we also have time varying data outcome. Um, so I will, before I dive in the details, I will give a motivation, motivating example to, to show you that, okay, what this kind of data look like. Um, so the motivating example is uh, from the, uh, the collaboration with my biologist, um, a few biologists, so they study. So here the population is a, a group of white baboons in Amboseli ecosystem in Kenya. So we have longitudinal observation data on this population for over a long span of time. So the goal, there are actually several different psychological goals, but the particular the, the goal is try to study the causal effect of early adversity in a baboon's life. Uh, for example, drought or maternal deaths, on their health outcomes later in life, uh, in their adulthood or survival. And particularly they want to, we want to study that whether those effects are mediated through some, uh, some mediators. Um, and there are different two different studies here. Um, I will, and then they require different uh, way of handling. So again, the exposure or treatment, focal treatment here is early adversity um, and uh, like deaths of, uh, of a mom in uh, when the baboon is young. So those are all pretty severe early adversity. So there are two studies. The first study is here outcome is uh, physiology stress. 
And those usually are measured by uh, fecal group corticoids um, hormone concentrations, essentially some hormone level that, uh, that measure your psychological stress. And then the mediator here is social bonds. Because in the baboons, in baboons' life, or the say, they are very close knit that live in troops, uh, in, in groups. So how about how baboons are socially connected to the other baboons are very very important uh, to their to their well being. So that's why our biologists think this is a very important uh, scientific question. So that that was that's the first question, uh, the first study. The, the second study is. They also, want, they again want to study the effect of early adversity, but now the outcome is survival, like how early adversity impact your survival. And the mediator here would be the uh, physiology stress, which again, in study one, that will be the outcome. So this is a scientific uh, background. So now let's look at the data, why we say this is a bit complicated or it's hard. It's, because here in these two studies, uh, depends on which study in, but you can see that Either the uh, both the social bonds and particularly the, the GC the the hormone level, they are measured repeatedly, and on sparse and irregular time grids throughout adult life. Okay, so um, so this is actually very this is very common e ecological study the the so called optimistic sampling. O obviously, you cannot ask a baboon to show up. Um, you know, on a regular basis to say, hey, give your arm and I, I will take, take your hormone level, right? So, so that's why that this kind of data is usually very, um, it, it's irregular. They, they sometimes they pick the, the, bio, the biologists in the field, pick up the, the, the feces, uh, the, the, the feces and the, then start to, to measure. So this is really not, this happened in a very irregular uh, base and they're pretty sparse. Okay, so that's, a, that's the first, that's basically the data structure. And another additional uh, challenge is different units can have different number of measurements. Some baboons you, you have lived very long and you have a very long time. You have uh, uh, quite many observations of their, of those baboons, but others died very early. So then you have a very short span. Uh, and another thing is we think the same unit, actually the, the, the social bonds, which is based on the observation and the GC hormone is based on the, the, the collection of feces, they are, they can be measured on very different grids. So here I just show you a, a very uh, simple, the examples of two bubbles. So you can see the trajectory of the, the data. So the this is the first one. This is uh, on the social bonds. You can see the, the bubble one, and then this is the social bonds on bubble two. You can see that they are measured, again, the, the density of the, the measurement is very different and also they're hugely irregular. Um, and the outcome is uh, the GC hormone. So this is, again, this is a, one example and this kind of data structure is not unique. Uh, to our study. And another prominent example I would say is uh, electronic health record data, EHR. That's also a case that, you know, patients usually don't, it's observational and patients do not always appear um, regularly. And they, they go to office, they, they go to clinic when they have some health uh, encounter, um, things like that. So in the end that the different patients have very different this kind of sparse and irregular observations, and it's longitudinal. Uh, so this is, so this is rather common. Okay. Um, so now, just talk about the main idea we have. So now we have this type of data, and we want to do mediation analysis, a uh, causal mediation uh, analysis. How do we do that? So the idea is, we will take, we, we, we will. Again, we think still we think the causal mediation framework of the EMI uh, 2010 paper, but we take a functional data analysis perspective to the data. So the key thing is we view the observed trajectories, whether they are um, mediators or outcome as realization from a smooth underlying stochastic processes. And then we will define causal estimate accordingly and estimation also accordingly. So then we will use functional functional data analysis approach, particularly functional principal component analysis, function PCA, to estimate the entire stochastic process from the observed data, the observed irregular uh, time series, or oh, not time series, uh, the trajectories. And then this will allow us to impute the values of this process at any time point of any unit. So, so then once we have this imputed data, uh, imputed process, 
then we can take that into, uh, we can plug that in into the structural equation model and then we estimate the causal effect. Okay, so this is, a, so this idea, this is really the idea that handles any um, irregular spots and irregular um, longitudinal data. So it doesn't matter whether it's outcome or it is mediated. So in our, in our motivating ap application, it will, is applicable to both studies, but in this talk, I will focus mostly on the, the case of a, just a longitudinal mediator and outcome. If I go back, essentially this study is we want to study one immediate is the social bonds and the outcome is the physiological stress that also measured over time. Okay, so then, um, so that's the background. Uh, now we have, so now we, we need to go to, the uh, define the causal and the, the slightly more technical stuff. Um, so bear with me with this part. So for each unit, uh, we say that we make observation at TI time points. So the TI uh, can vary across different units. And also at each time point, uh, TIJ, we observe a mediator. Um, and after the mediator, we and before the next time, time span uh, before the next time point, we also observe the outcome, uh, Y, I, J. And then of course, we also observe a vector of static or time varying covariates that is independent of the treatment uh, and the mediated outcome, um, which we denote by X. So as I mentioned earlier, the key here is so we have all of this. So if you draw the graph, you will see the M and Y, they are, um, they're, they're uh, those irregular, um, trajectories. Oh, again, just a full simplicity uh, here for, for the, the notation here, essentially to assume that the, uh, the, the time grid for M uh, for the median outcome is the same, but that can be easily, very easily extended to the, to the case that they are different within the same unit. So, but the, the, for notation uh, reason, I just stick to, to this one. And as I mentioned earlier, the key of our approach is to view the observed mediator and outcome uh, as values drawn from an underlying smooth process, uh, MT and YT. Okay, so this is a, a, this measurement error. It's just this one. So then the key idea is, well, we will actually first estimate this uh, stochastic, this smooth process, and then we will model the, the relationship, the causal relationship with Z uh, using this uh, smooth process instead of this underlying, uh, instead of this very noisy and irregular observations. Okay, so uh, some further, of course, to do causal inference, we need to define causal estimate. And before that, we have, to, we have to define potential outcomes. So there are further notations here. Again, bear with me. Um, also here, we use bold found to denote a process up until time t. So M subscript t is a process, time process that up until time t and same for y. And you can see that here, I particularly move the time uh, to the subscript to avoid uh, confusing with the potential outcomes that I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, soon. And then of course we assume pseudova. Here we assume pseudova. Now we can define, so mz, which is again, you, I, I assume everyone's familiar with the potential outcome framework already. So MT, um, MITZ is just the potential values of the underlying um, mediated process for unit T, unit I until time T under treatment Z. And so this is common and then outcome. So the potential outcome here is a little bit more complex. So potential outcome Y, T is here is, um, it's defined as a function of two things, two arguments. One is Z, which is a treatment. The other is M. So this is basically potential outcome for unit I until time T under the treatment Z. The key thing is also the mediator process take value of M. Okay, so again, this is also rather standard in the uh, this uh, double argument a potential outcome is rather standard in mediation analysis. The key here is that we extend the, the M and here the mediator is a process. Uh, so of course, among all the um, fundamental problem of causal inference, we only observe one realization uh, of the mediator and the outcome that is, uh, that is corresponding to the observed treatment. 
looks like this. So just a quick note here, of course, for the outcome, potential outcome, for, for the potential outcome, here M can take anything you want, you would like in principle, but in reality, we usually look at this thing, the, the potential outcome of y, uh, Z on, y, Z and the M, the mediator is also a potential outcome under a particularly, uh, a particular treatment. And of course the, the uh, controversial, but very important uh, point of uh, uh, causal mediation analysis is one Z, one here, this treatment corresponding to the Y and also this treatment corresponding to the mediated process, if they're different, then this is so-called crossword counterfactual. They're a priori, uh, you know, counterfactual. So they are, this is very controversial, but this is necessary for us to define mediators. And there's a lot of recent discussion of how, particularly by Judith Locke, uh, a few, uh, several months ago, present here, talk about how to extend that or avoid bypass across word counterfactual. Again, that's a kind of a different talk. So uh, I will not, so in this talk, we'll just use the uh, standard uh, approach in the uh, standard approach in quantum mediation. Uh, so we, we will not get into this uh, con this controversy about crossword counterfactual. We will use those to define our causal estimate. And so now we define our causal estimate. This is again, extending the standard literature uh, in, in, this, uh, in this topic. So total effects is easy, non-controversial total effects, but of course, here now, because we're talking about everything, because we're talking about longitudinal data, so all the effects I'm going to define, the total effects, indirect effects, and direct effects, they will all be functions of time t. Um, so total effects at time t is defined just as, well, y1 minus y0. Um, and, uh, and here, the yeah, it's just, I will not re read this, but uh, essentially it's just kind of the marginal, margin, marginalized over the, uh, mediator, okay? And then the key point of um, causal mediation analysis is to define this direct effects and indirect effects. And the, we can define the average causal mediation uh, effects, ACME, or uh, also known as natural indirect effects as this. Again, a function of T. It's just, if you look at this, I will not read it out, but the key thing is here is a contrast of two potential outcome, two potential outcomes while when you fix the treatment status, but switch the mediated process from corresponding to treatment zero to treatment one. And you can see this is defined either for both treatment zero and for treatment one. And of course, here you can see that if here we use Z, let's say is zero, then that means this first thing is across word counterfactual, but that's just how it's defined. Uh, so this is ACME. And uh, so the other way, and in corresponding to that, we can also define the average natural direct effect. So the, the, the ACME is indirect effects. Now we can define also uh, natural direct effects. That is just to instead fix the mediated process, but switch the treatment uh, status. So that is, so you can see that clearly, um, again, if you're familiar with called the mediation analysis, those are all, um, pretty standard, but if you are not, then this is this takes some. This slide will take some time to digest. Um, the key point is that the total effects is can be easy. You can easily prove that the total effects is a sum of this uh, sum of this uh, direct effects and indirect effects. So, in reality, so in practice, we only need to identify two of the three estimates. Then we can actually. And then we will be able to identify all of these effects. Uh, so I know there will be questions, but uh, I promise you very quickly, if in two slides, we will get to the questions. Um, the, uh, so now after we define this causal estimate, of course, the question is how do we identify them? And this is all causal inference, uh, a large portion of causal inference is about. So the identification assumption here, um, it's just, again, extending the uh, EMI framework to time varying situation. So the first assumption is very standard it's called ignorability or unconfoundedness. So this is, this is very, uh, very well known in the, in the literature. It's just, well, condition this, you can look through this, but this basically say that condition on the observed covariance 
the treatment is randomly assigned with respect to the both the mediator and the outcome. So if I look at the, uh, so it's, it's easy to look at the DAC. Basically, there, there's no treatment. There's no treatment outcome confounder, and there's no treatment mediated confounder. This is rather standard, and the, um, this is, of course, this is a strong assumption, but uh, it's not as strong as the next one, which is coming, which I will spend some time on. So the second, oh, and another thing to say is, of course, in our uh, setting, the, because it's a time varying setting, so everything is, um, um, so now we have the process. So when we define all of this uh, ignorability, everything, uh, it really involves a concept of a small, small time window. Like we we're talking about, we're talking about increment. Um, so this has become more clear when we talk about the second assumption, which is really crucial to uh, mediation analysis, is so-called sequential ignorability. So <laughs> sequential ignorability is very, um, the formula looks like this, so it's hard to read, um, but you can think, essentially it assumes that at any time point, and then in a sufficient small, at any time, and in a sufficient small time interval at any time, the increment, this basically says the increment in the potential outcome is independent of the incre increment of the observed mediators, conditional on the treatment covariance and the uh, mediator process up until that time. Okay, so this is still, again, very hard to digest, I would say. So I draw two dots here. If you see that the, the, the first one is uh, the DAG, the left panel of the DAG, it's a uh, kind of easy to understand, easier, well, uh, it's basically say that there's no unmeasured confounder that affect both mediator and outcome in that small time interval, okay? And this is about the small time interval. It doesn't say that over time, it has to hold at the um, long time interval. It's just a small time interval. And the second one, the particular for this, um, for, for this, uh, for our specific, uh, study here, we also assume that, you know, that it doesn't conditional on the previous outcome. And this is really a strong assumption and Georgia will offer some discussion on that. But this assumption actually is not unique. We, this is, uh, it's in different form, but essentially it's the same as that for regular space mediator that assumed in uh, Bind et al. 2015 paper and also Vanderbilt and the Chen Chen 2017 paper. Um, so I think this is a, uh, and this is a good place to uh, stop for questions. So any questions? Yeah, there's no, uh, well, let's see. There's, yeah, there's no unanswered questions. Okay, so, okay, so yeah, so this is, so then I'll proceed. Um, so then with these two assumptions, we can actually show that, um, you know, not surprisingly with these two assumptions, you can prove that uh, this, uh, all this all these treatment effects are non-parametric identifiable from the data. And then you look at this, this is nothing surprised, right? But what, what is useful from the theorem is actually to look into particularly the expression of the, the natural indirect effect to see what is important actually when we do estimation because identification is really non-parametric. You cannot use that in practice for, for real thing. Uh, so if we look at this, you can see that we really need to, for estimation, we actually need to have two models. The first model is the, uh, mediator given the treatment and the cover uh, and the uh, coverage and the second is the outcome is the outcome given is a model for outcome conditional on the treatment and the mediator and the coverage and this is not surprised at all right so this is essentially um, this is parallel to the baron Kenny two uh, structure equation uh, model uh, the framework um, we just need these two models. So then the key question is actually under this framework, how do we do the uh, uh, modeling and estimation? Um, so the, uh, so of course the, 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 our structure here is we have sparse and irregular trajectories for both Y and M. And second, because the data is very noisy, the, the estimation can be also very noisy. So how do we properly take into account of uh, the uh, uncertainty estimating the the trajectories. So our proposal, the first one is we use functional PCA approach to model and reduce those irregular uh, spaces, uh, trajectories into a few, just a few principal components. 
and then then we take that into the estimation. And the second, we use Bayesian approach uh, for the modeling to proper adjust the uh, to proper quantify the uncertainty. Okay, so then after that things become relatively uh, you know, straightforward if you are familiar with the functional data analysis literature. Um, so that, take for example, we, how do we model the outcome, the immediate process? Um, we just assume the immediate process have the Karakunin uh, law of decomposition. Essentially, we can just decompose this, uh, we, we can decompose the, the, the immediate process into the, uh, and the linear combination of the also normal eigenfunctions or the so-called principal components and the principal scores. In other words, that each curve or each um, trajectory can be represented by just a few, by, by its uh, unique represented by its uh, principal the scores. Okay, and usually, of course, this is theoretically, this needs in go to infinity, but usually just a few, we find that just a few, the principal, a few principal components, so three or four, uh, explain most of the variation, and that, that's what we take in, uh, in our estimation. And of course, this process is not directly observed, so we need to estimate it from the uh, observed, from the observed trajectories. So the real modeling happens like this. We first, we, we were truncate to just the first R principal components and usually three or four is enough if they, and then the, uh, of course, the other, the main uh, take into account of the covariates in this, uh, in this shape. And then we use some, we, we use the uh, parameterized, there are different ways of uh, parameterize this, parameterize the both the principal components and the principal scores. So th this is how do you estimate that? That's a key point in the a key topic in functional data analysis. We just take the uh, Kova and the Borois uh, uh, approach of parameterization. So what we do is we actually express those those phi, which is principal components, as a the linear combination of a thin plate uh, spline basis uh, for flexibility. Uh, for flexibility, and also we assume that the principal scores also follow normal distribution, and then uh, we use Bayesian approach just to have the Gaussian process prior for the principal components, and uh, you know other and multiplicative uh, gamma prior for the for the principal scores. So this is rather standard at at this point. But what is very interesting uh, in this study is actually how do we deal with the outcome model? So the outcome model, of course, is also just a similar principal or uh, functional principal component model. But what is the really uh, interesting thing is in the context of mediation analysis is how do we deal with the mediator? So the mediator, we actually allow, so this modeling is we allow the mediator enter the model for the outcome uh, in a functional form. Uh, in a functional form, this, can, this highly depends on how do we choose that uh, really uh, decide the, the, the model feature. So they, for example, one easy way is a so-called concurrent model. We can just say, well, the outcome of time t only depends on the mediator right in right before uh, time t. So that's concurrent model. You can, of course, also take into the lack outcome, basically say the outcome at that time t depends on the mediator, uh, the, uh, the previous the previous n lag, n lag, um, mediators. And the more interesting thing we think is would be the accumulated model, essentially allow the time t the, the model, the outcome be dependent on the entire process of mediated process up until time t. So that would, that, that is, um, the form would be like this. And uh, then you can study essential lag of the whole, uh, the, the whole time span. And in practice, one so in estimation, how we estimate this, we will estimate the, both the outcome model and the mediator model, these two models separately. We don't do a, so we are not really a diehard Bayesian. If you're a diehard Bayesian, you'll think that we should model everything simultaneously. But here we didn't, we, we estimate them separately. And then we actually just use imputed mediator process, the value plug into this in the outcome model. So that, that's how we, how we fit that. And the, uh, and so, of course, those are the modeling. And in the end, we are still, we are not interested particularly in this coefficients, right? We are interested in this causal estimate. And it's not surprising that you can actually express all the causal estimate I defined earlier 
as the functions of the model coefficients. Uh, the, the form it look, looks like this, and uh, you don't really need to look, look carefully. That it's just possible that we, we it, it's very uh, actually straightforward to calculate those, transform the model coefficients into the uh, causal effects. And then the because we use Bayesian, uh, life is easy. Well, the inference is easy. The posterior inference is very straightforward. They just use MCMC and then plug into the above formula. And this is again because we are actually estimating these two things separately. This is very uh, this is applicable when the time degrees of the outcome and the mediator are different within the same unit. And also, it's very easy to extend it to survival outcome, of course, you need to change a little bit the identification assumption, but you can change, for example, this outcome model just to be a, to a professional, uh, the Cox proportional hazards model, and then the uh, estimation can proceed. So this is another place uh, can stop for questions. Uh, sure, yeah, we have a question from an anonymous attendee, so I'll just read it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it says, in many applications, the pattern of when observations occur over time is informative. That is, it is related to the value of the underlying realization of the stochastic process. For example, in electronic health record data, people are more likely to have medical visits when they are sick. Have you thought about how to accommodate this or do sensitivity analyses to detect this? Yes, yes. So that, that's a that's a very good question. So why I don't think I have a time to talk about sensitivity analysis, sure. but uh, uh, yeah, this is absolutely uh, absolutely true. So if I look at these uh, assumptions, uh, sequential vulnerability, actually I'm very unhappy <laughs> about this or something. Well, this is not unhappy, but uh, I'm very um, aware of this assumption is really, really strong. Essentially the previous outcome, it would depend, the most likely would depend, the previous outcome would be very uh, informative about the, the next step uh, mediated uh, uh, and the outcome. So yeah, so sensitivity uh, analysis is approach. The other way is uh, to directly incorporate the why into that. And that's something we're thinking of. And again, this, this assumption actually has been assumed before in the literature. And uh, we actually, as far as we know, that people don't even do sensitive analysis. We do some sensitive analysis and we found, I will talking quite uh, soon that actually it's the result is very sensitive to these assumptions. So this is a big concern. And uh, this is something I, uh, we will try to address, but uh, I didn't address in, the, in this paper. That's a very good point. Uh, thank okay. you. So maybe uh, we can, and go on for now. We'll, we have yeah, time at so, the end. We'll do more questions. Again, I, I only have five more minutes and I have almost <laughs> and I always uh, talk longer. So I will just very quickly run through the uh, the application. Um, again, back to the baboon study. Baboon study here, we only have 192 adults and female baboons and we have six sources of early adversity. So we did conduct analysis separate for each uh, source. And then we also collect the biological relevant covariates, a bunch of them. And then the assumptions. So yeah, how to address the assumptions. So assumption here, the ignorability or the uncompounded assumption is uh, relatively plausible because the early adversity like the maternal deaths or the rain or the drought, those are largely randomized by nature. So that's easy. Uh, that's relatively um, Plausible, but the sequential ignorability is much harder to, uh, to to satisfy. And so what we did is we did some sensitive analysis in the end to check and turn out that it's actually very sensitive to those assumptions. Okay, um, so just quickly see that how functional PCA uh, works in, uh, in action. So this this is for the that left panel is the first uh, PC, two PC for the mediator process. So we can see, and the, the, the right panel is for the outcome process. So you can see that in the, so in both cases, like the first two principal components take into account over 80% of variation. And actually the, the first three principal components take into account, can account for uh, over 90% of the, uh, the variation. So that's what the, the number we end up with. And then we, we did the model. So, so you can see that here, I actually draw, just, just show you the data. I, I draw the outcome, the, uh, the observed data for three baboons. So we, I draw the observed data, the, the trajectory versus the smooth, it's a dashed line, smoothed imputed uh, underlying process. So you can see that this are three baboons, they, they experience different number of adversity. So you can see that again, the lens is really different. Some baboons live very long, some baboons live you know, very short, and this is just a year. Um, so you can see that and you, 
I would say that actually the underlying process is a pretty, it's a smooth representation of the, uh, the uh, capture the trend of the, uh, the noisy trajectories. Um, okay, so then this is just a principal scores. Again, uh, the, this is the draw of the, the principal scores of the first principal, uh, first two principal components. Um, Again, the I don't have much time, and uh, so there's uh, uh, some for this particular study. What, what we find is uh, we find early adversity has significant total effects on the uh, total effects on the baboons, uh, you know, the stress level uh, across the whole adulthood, and also we find that early adversity has very this also has a very significant effect on the mediator alone. But interesting enough, then after combining all of this, we actually find this very little indirect effects uh, through the, the, the indirect through the uh, social bonds. So even though social bonds, uh, there's a lot of hypothetical process, biological process of the uh, saying that the, the social bonds are very important, uh, then very important. But in this case, we find that actually earlier, but there's, Diversity seem to have a strong effect on the um, stress in adulthood, but it doesn't seem to doesn't seem to mediate through uh, social bonds. So this this work is, uh, and we find actually very similar result also on survival um, on survival. So we are still work, working on that. And then um, I really I don't think I have time to talk about sensitivity analysis, but uh, this is ultra important. So how do we handle sensitivity analysis, particularly about the sequential ignorability? So what we did is we extend the uh, again the EMI approach to the to this stochastic process. So the main idea I quickly go through the main idea is to say that well uh, go back to the model. So it's very model based. Go back to the model. Say the mediated uh, model uh, for both the mediated model and outcome model. We assume there's there's the unmeasured, there's this residual due to unmeasured confounding. And so if the sequential ignorability is a uh, host, then these two residuals should be orthogonal to each other, so we should be independent to each other. So what we do is we, the sensitivity parameter essentially is a row, is a correlation between the two the residuals in the uh, mediated model and in the outcome model. And then we just, uh, we shuffle that, we fix that to a few different numbers and re refit the model and then see how different the result would be. And unfortunately we find the result actually are uh, our result pretty in this particular study are pretty sensitive to the um, uh, to to the role. But then they again, unfortunately, I don't have much time, so I, I I will try to wrap up in two minutes. But just a few important comments on sensitive analysis. So we did this on sensitive analysis, and we admit that it's uh, sensitive. But the but what is even more troubling is so so this. More troubling is this type of sensitivity analysis is the sensitivity parameter is a, is a correlation. So it's a scale free and it's very hard to interpret. So we say it's sensitive, it's sensitive, sensitive is because when we shuffle the row, say from point one to point two, the results differ quite much, but we don't know because this is scale free. We actually don't know um, whether point one is really a strong violation of the correlation uh, of the assumption um, we don't know how strong it is. So this is very different. This is actually back to some observation I have for sensitive analysis. We know sensitive analysis is a big deal in cause inference, but to my surprise in mediation analysis, this is actually not very commonly done. Um, and the, the, the literature on the sensitive analysis in mediation analysis is actually very sparse. So that's why when we run this sensitive analysis, we, we run into the trouble, how do we interpret the result? And just again, many of the study simply just very sensitive. So you don't, or you don't even see that they present the uh, sensitive analysis results. So I think this is actually a direction that uh, probably future research should uh, um, pay more, uh, a little bit more attention. Um, so, I'm now at the end of my talk, so I don't. Uh, so I just quickly wrap up what I um, what we did. So here we propose a, a framework for causal mediation analysis with sparse and irregular longitudinal mediator and outcome. And we the, the key idea is we view the observed trajectories as realizations from underlying smooth process. And uh, then we use a Bayesian functional PCA approach to uh, within this uh, two SEM framework to do the estimation. Um, and we apply the method to, to study the, the baboon uh, project to, to study the effect between early diversity, social bounds, and stress. And then in the end, we devised um, sensitivity analysis approach and a method. And in the end, 
in the end, we end up with probably more questions than answers in terms of sensitivity. Um, so again, this is the first uh, kind of steps of this uh, pro, uh, of this uh, type of analysis, and uh, I I am aware of uh, all the limitations, and uh, I I just hope that there will be more studies in this uh, very hard topic. Um, I don't have time to talk about a bit more about mediation, and this is all relevant papers. Thank you. Fantastic, fun. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, we will now switch over to the discussion. So we will have Georgia present some slides. And after that, fun, you will have the opportunity to respond. And uh, Georgia, uh, whenever you're ready. So you can see the slides. Yep, that's great. OK, awesome. Um, thanks for uh, for the invitation to be the discussion fan and Shusi, I really enjoy reading your paper. Everything you guys write is so well written. So um, we appreciate that. Um, so had the task to discuss this paper and fan already covered a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, but hopefully I'll have the chance to go into some more of the details. So the reason why I really, really, really like mediation analysis is that if you tell someone, okay, the effect of this treatment is that, they will start wondering why is the effect what it is. We'll start wondering, okay, well, let's imagine that it goes through this pathway or that pathway, and mediation analysis is exactly what helps us answer these questions. So even if we don't formally do it, it is actually in the back of our heads every time we estimate a causal effect, at least in, any, in many of the applied settings that I, I have worked on in the past. Now, the classic mediation analysis has focused on, of course, the, the single time point and the single treatment mediator and outcome, but there have been extensions that consider data that are measured over time. Either the treatment is measured over time or the mediator is measured over, over time. But there is less work that has been done in the literature for, for the setting where both the mediator and the outcome are measured over time. And I include a couple other references here. So I think that this is uh, one of the important contributions of this paper, that the fact that they focus on this very, very hard setting and the fact that the outcome is measured over time actually creates a lot of the difficulties that they have to face in making, it, in making their assumptions and their identification. Another um, key contribution of the paper, and uh, I don't think that something like this was done previously in the, in the literature, but of course I might be wrong, is that they're dealing with, with mediators and outcomes that are measured at uh, an irregular grid, temporal grid. So um, dealing with that also creates a lot, of, a lot of problems about how to deal with, with the data that are not measured at the same time point, and I hopefully will get into that also here. So I will try to focus on, on three topics of this paper that I found very interested and interesting and, and puzzled me. And I won't really provide many solutions, but hopefully I will provide food, of, food for thought for um, the authors and anybody else here in the audience. So the three questions, so the three topics I'll try to focus on is how do longitudinal outcomes uh, affect or matter in mediation analysis? Then I will talk about the complications that arise from the regular space grid, and then hopefully provide some intuition and, and some, some paths forward with using stochastic interventions on this longitudinal mediator. So like I said, mo in most situations, the outcome is measured once. In most situations in, in mediation analysis, we might have a longitudinal treatment and mediator, but we really only have the outcome measured in the end. Whereas here, the outcome is measured longitudinally. So how, this, uh, how the previous outcomes should be incorporated in the analysis is, is confusing and perhaps complicated. In fact, in this sequential ignorability assumption that Fan talked about, and she also brought up this point, the, the assignment of the mediator at a small time interval is assumed to be independent of potential outcomes over that, of the difference in potential outcomes over that same time period but that doesn't condition, that assumption does not condition on previously observed outcomes. So in this situation, if previous outcomes affect what change you will see in the mediator um, and also potentially affect future outcomes, this assumption is, is likely to be, to be violated. 
And I, I have trouble trying to find a situation or an, an applied setting where this assumption would hold without conditioning on the observed, process, observed outcome process up to time pointing. Now, in, in, some, in another setting with a functional treatment mediator and outcome, um, other authors did condition on previous outcomes for a similar assumption. And then in, in another paper, they did not. So I think that it really is hard how to, um, I, I really think we need more work on clarifying what are the, the assumptions and the interpretation of those assumptions in the setting where we have a longitudinal outcome in our mediation analysis. I really think that a sequential ignorability that doesn't condition on the observed outcome process will be likely to be violated. But I also wonder whether conditioning on these observed outcomes or requiring these observed outcomes for, for unconfoundedness or for the sequential ignorability would lead to some kind of issue with exposure-induced confounding in the sense that previous outcomes are affected by the exposure and are now affecting future mediator and outcome values. And therefore, are exposure-induced confounders, and we don't really know how to deal with them well in this setting. Now, I also, I'm, I'm also wondering whether a survival outcome is any different or not. And my intuition is that it is, but also if you think of survival outcome as a longitudinal outcome that are different time points, you, um, that are, are consecutive time points, you know, you observe an individual and if they have survived, they have survived, they have survived until they, they haven't. Um, if you think of that as a longitudinal outcome, then maybe it is, it also has the same pitfalls uh, that we're, we're talking about here, but is a survival outcome different in the sense that since the survival status is on up until it's not, maybe it doesn't have all of these issues with um, needing to, uh, to um, incorporate the survival up to time t in the sequential ignorability assumption. Now, Fen, in the manuscript, Fen and Shusi, they, they did sensitivity analysis by including previous outcomes in the in, in their models, but I also, it's not clear to me that, that that would be a valid way to perform sensitivity analysis, considering that, that it's not even clear whether we could, in theory, condition on previous outcomes in sequential ignorability and still have uh, identification and parametric identification. So the second topic, hopefully I'll go a little faster. The second topic I will talk about is this problem, the complications that, that come up with irregularly spaced data. And I think that the, the approach in the paper is, is very elegant and um, it got me thinking a lot about what it means to have an underlying process uh, and how, what, what it means to have potential mediator and outcome processes. Um, so instead of talking about now potential values of the mediator that would have been observed, we're talking about potential values of an underlying process that gives, that gives rise to these uh, potential values that would have been observed otherwise. So I'm really struggling to wrap my head around what it means to, to define potential outcomes in terms of the underlying processes that are themselves unobserved and they could have never been observed even at the time points where data were collected. Are we thinking then that the realized values of the mediator and outcome are just random draws of these processes? So do we see potential mediator and outcomes are, as random themselves? Are we thinking of the values as, as measurement error versions of the true values? Like do we think that it was the instruments that we used to measure the mediator and the outcome that led to this discrepancy? Or are we thinking of these processes, as kind of the, the distribution that units with the same covariance and same characteristics uh, would have for the whole mediator path under treatment and control? So it, it was, it's a little confusing to me to try to kind of wrap my head around what it means to have uh, potential outcomes and estimates defined in terms of, of, of uh, unobservable processes. So, um, there's a lot of debate in the mediation literature about this, about cross-world assumptions, but to me, like these potential outcomes, even the potential outcome that is uh, Y1M1 that sets the treatment at, at one uh, and the mediator at, at its value under treatment, even that, uh, that uh, potential outcome is not 
clear what it means in this setting because we're thinking of the outcome if we were to set the treatment of one, but the mediator at its process value over time. And it's, it's not really related to what we observed in, in our data. It's something that is underlying our potential outcomes. So how do I see this potentially like being resolved? One of the solutions that I see is that if we think of the mediator and outcome values as random, given this mediator and outcome process, maybe at an individual level, we can define individual average potential outcomes. And, we, and, and, th and those individual average potential outcomes would represent the average outcome we would see for a specific unit if we were to draw uh, from um, to draw values from the mediator process randomly and repeatedly. And then using those individual average potential outcomes, we're essentially getting rid of the randomness in these um, in this in these processes, and we can um, more directly uh, represent potential outcomes based on the realized values. And then we can contrast averages of those individual average potential outcomes over the population to define direct and indirect effects. Now, another solution that that um, I see moving forward would be perhaps to instead of fixing the mediator for each unit to its mediator process value under treatment or control, maybe we can think about interventions that uh, while the, the treatment is set to um, you know, treatment and the mediator value, instead of setting it to its value uh, of the process under control, we're thinking of interventions that set the distribution of the mediator values over the whole population to be the same as a distribution of the mediator values under um, treatment, under, con under controlling the observed data. So those, those types of, of situations would be related to the organic direct and indirect effects that Judith talked about. Um, so in, in, this, in this second type of solution, uh, we wouldn't think of the potential outcomes as random draws, but instead we would think of the distribution of mediator values over the whole population as having a given, a given intervention. So I think that this is this is all I wanted to talk about. I, I really did enjoy the paper and I hope that the, this can um, help us move forward in this in this setting. And it, it is truly a really complicated setting when you have a longitudinal outcome. Fantastic. Thanks for the great discussion, Georgia. Um, Fun, do you want to respond quickly? And that I have one minute. <laughs> so I, um, I think Georgia touched a lot of topics I've been thinking, and we actually discussed a few things. So I, I want to say the the um, I don't want to uh, prolong the, the talk. So maybe I, one thing I can just one slide. I have one slide I didn't talk in my uh, before. So maybe I could actually share. It's more about. Just in general, my observation of mediation analysis, this is the first time I did the mediation analysis. And then I, again, I end up with more um, questions than uh, answers. So I, I want to share this with the audience of whoever do uh, mediation analysis. You see my slides, right? Do you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so the title is, the slide is why mediation causal mediation is not more popular. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Baron Kenny is really popular and people use this again and again. But the mediation, causal mediation, despite all this wonderful uh, theoretical development, it's just not so popular, at least among the practitioner. It's very hard to say that this is popular because particularly Liz Stewart, I want to talk by Liz Stewart uh, in 2019. So they did a survey on the uh, mental health literature since around 2018, maybe a little bit longer a period of time, but what do they find is really a damping uh, picture. It's about the thousands of the papers in mental health in that year um, that mentioned the concept of mediation. Around 10, how oh, they say it's a last number, 10 used causal mediation. This is despite that uh, Tyler Vanderbilt had this wonderful software of mediation. Right, so very, and there's, of course, this non-paper did anything like sensitive analysis. 
So this is like we are we call the people actually we are working very hard on through or uh, doing all of this work and uh, try to solve the conceptual problems and the computational problem, but in reality people don't use it. Uh, this is this is pretty uh, discouraging. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking. So I when I was doing this, I was thinking that okay, why this is the case, right? We know that this is conceptually so. Mediation is causal mediation is conceptually and practically hard, even with software. And I think even more um, to me, it's even more unsettling is I find all these assumptions are they're so crucial in actually interpreting this uh, the in, interpreting what we get as causal, but they are untestable and most likely they are violated in real world, and the results are sensitive. And of course, you can you can. We can criticize. We can say the same thing about uncompoundedness assumption in the single uh, time point, uh, single non-mediation but causal analysis. But at least there, we I think we have a better grip on the like how do we actually ensure overlap and balance so that the assumptions are more or less uh, are more suitable. There are other ways of instrumental variable and things like that to make it work. And also there's a lot of work in sensitive analysis. But I feel the mediation analysis is uh, it's much harder. Sequential ignorability itself is it's hard cross word counterfactual. And it's just very hard to satisfy and very hard to check. Um, so, and then if we just zoom, zoom out to see that what causal mediation has really done is, well, the core to me is still this two state, is this a two structural equation model framework, right? So this is just, a, in some sense, it's a fancy version of the Baron Kenny. And then, but the, the causal, the main ingredient of causal is to add into all those causal assumptions, say under those assumptions, this you can interpret those uh, structural equation model as a causal. But then going back, if the key thing is uh, those assumptions, but those assumptions actually are untestable and uh, most likely violated, yeah, how how can we really convince people to really use that? So so this is I feel that this actually why causal mediation is not popular. It's not a coincidence. It, it's not a coincidence. It's there's a deeper reason in it. So sometimes so I actually in this study I, I talked to my collaborator in the end I I told them I I said that yeah you can you 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 can call it mediation, but don't particularly put uh, attach the word causal there because I feel. I I feel uneasy, right? So again, I I feel that this is this is I end up with more questions than, than answers. But I feel that as a causal causal inference people, that we uh, researchers we have to think very hard in bridging in kind of developing our theory, but also uh, how to relate to practice. And there's a lot of hard questions to to solve. I don't have answers to that, but I just encourage you all to think about that. So that's my kind of response. All right, great, thank you. I think now it's uh, time that we uh, slowly wrap up. So yeah, first first of all, thank you, Fan, for uh, for a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you, Shushi, for like answering all these uh, questions in Q and A, and thank you for Georgia for a very nice discussion. Um, next time, uh, we'll have uh, Frederick Xavier from Yale University who will talk about balancing covariates in randomized experiments using the Gram Schmidt walk. We all, all hope that you stay safe until then. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.